Hey everyone, welcome back to the Whirling Circles Internal Martial Arts Podcast. I'm your host Sean Garcia with Frank Allen and Joe Molinar. And we're excited to be back this week. We are in June. It's it's awesome. I'm excited. I don't know how it's June already, but we're in June. Um, and we've had some wacky weather, but it's it's all good. The sun is shining. Frank, how are you feeling this week? I'm feeling good, feeling real good. Same as last week, I'm feeling extra good today because, again, with Goldie's private lesson, we got in some boxing. That always makes me happy. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, been, yeah, beginning it in uh, in the morning time prior to the podcast recording? Yeah, yeah, his lesson's at 8.30. Oh, that's a good start to the day. Yeah, awesome. And, John, how are you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling good. Happy that... Um... Well, I was away camping for the weekend in all the rain and everything, so I'm rather happy to be back in New York, and um, the weather improved when I came back, and everything's more comfortable, so. Were you, like, tent camping? No, thank God. We would have we would have come back. Uh, it was cabin rentals, but it was still, um, the bathrooms were not in the cabin, the, you know, like, we had we rigged an enormous enormous tarp which saved the weekend uh so that different people could we could all cook out and stuff together um but yeah it was a cold and wet weekend yeah and i heard the campsites were all sold out and packed for memorial day weekend they were uh so anyways i'm i'm rather happy to be back back home for the comfort factor at least yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, s- same here. It was like, well, the weekend actually was the rain w- brought like a welcomed rest because I've been uh, grinding for the past couple of weeks and 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 it feel it felt like the rain forced me to slow down and we got to get some chores done in the house. But also, it feels like we've entered into a new uh, kind of energy um, going into June where I feel less hectic and. Um, more grounded. So I'm excited about that for sure. Um, Yeah. Cool. All right. So, yeah. So um, we're going to be this week, we're going to be doing one of our um, bio pieces, which is one of our more more popular kind of topics on our podcast. We get a lot of uh, viewership. Um, And this week we're going to be covering uh, the life and legacy of Sun Ludang, um, who we'll get into details of who he is and 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 you know, his contribution to the internal martial arts. Um, But definitely excited to cover this because we were doing some research um, in preparation for the show. And we saw that there was no, as as, as far as we could find, there was no other audio or video um, kind of biographic documentation on on Sun Ludong. So we're excited to contribute also to, in a historical way um, to, you know, to, to bring that, that, that kind of medium um, and, and bring more life, more light to his story and his contributions. So with that, we, we can get into it. So uh, Frank, you want to start us off and, and kind of break down um, who Sun Ludong is? Sure. Well, for openers, it's amazing. There's nothing on video. Sun Ludong is probably the most influential internal martial artist in history, bar none. He was one of the first to do all three internal martial arts, Xing Yi Chuen, Ba Gui Zhang, and Tai Chi Chuen. He was the first to publish uh, books on internal martial arts. Before that, they were manuals, but they were like master to student, handwritten or printed in very, very small amounts. There's no public uh, literature on the internal martial arts before Sun Lu Dong. And he was the person that made the biggest contribution to the correlations between Taoism, Chinese mysticism, the I Ching, and the internal martial arts. He was the guy who brought it out, the first one to bring it into public. They were, of course, the founder knew about it, and his teacher, Chen Tinghua, knew about it to a certain extent, but he was the most uh, studied in the subject and the first one to bring it to the public at all. So it's absolutely the most influential person in the internal martial arts. Mm. Born in 1861, 
into a poor farming family at a time when the dynasty was taxing the hell out of the common people and they could barely keep up with anything. And his father was a farmer who may have been able to make a profit, but was almost just doing subsistence farming because he had to pay the taxes all the time. And when Sun Ludang was uh, seven, he was noted for being really intelligent and he was starting to pick up stuff they noticed he could read. And his father actually hustled up the money, went into a little bit in debt to get him a teacher. And he immediately picked up stuff quickly and became very, very adept at reading and writing, which in Chinese is not easy. If any of you've been around it, I mean, the reading and writing like it take 2,000 different characters to reach a level where you could read a newspaper, much less anything deeper than that. And the characters have anywhere from one to 26 strokes. And not only do you have to be able to do them, but if you don't do the strokes in order, you're not literate. You have to know this stroke follows that stroke. And by the time he was nine, he was quite proficient in reading. But at that point, the taxes went up again. And his father couldn't afford to pay his teacher anymore. And then it got even worse. And his father went into debt and had to sell everything, even the farm, to pay the taxes to stay out of jail for not going to jail for non-payment of taxes, which taxed the old man to the point where shortly after that he promptly died. Mm. And leaving Sun Ludong and his mom destitute, no land anymore, nothing going on. And she couldn't figure out how to take care of him. So she took him to the local rich guy's house and asked to please take him on as a servant. And he said, well, he looks a little weak and spindly, but he seems fairly smart. So, okay, I'll take him on for room and board, but he's not getting any money or anything beyond room and board because he won't be able to work more than that. And he went to work for this guy, and this guy was a bully and used to beat him whenever anything would seem slightly out of line. And he had a son that was two years older than Sun Lu Dang, who at that point, by the way, his name was uh, Sun Fu Chuen, hmm. was his first name. Chinese tend to change names along the way, and at that point, he was Sun Fu Chuen. And uh, the son, two years older than him, was a worse bully than his father. Anytime he got a chance, he was beaten on Sun Lu Dong. And Sun Lu Dong had to stay there because otherwise his mother would have to take care of him and she couldn't take care of him. So he's putting up with this. And then one day while he's out watching the sheep, he hears these people yelling on top of the hill and he goes up and he discovers a martial arts class. And he tells the teacher that he wants to train. And the teacher's like, nah, I don't think so. And he keeps hanging out, watching, kind of copying the movements. And finally, the teacher says, hmm, you seem to have some talents. OK, you can join the class. And it was a, a Shaolin class. So at 10 years old, he started studying his first martial arts with this local Shaolin teacher. But he couldn't show back at the house that he knew it. He still couldn't defend himself against the sun. You know, so he's still getting beat up by the sun and whatnot. But he's training. And he's getting really good. He's becoming one of the teacher's top young students. But he can't do any of it at work. And then it comes time they're getting off for a holiday, probably a Chinese New Year. And he's got on his one good shirt. And he's about ready to go home and visit mom for a bit. When the son comes out, he goes, we're here, been studying martial arts. Well, you know. And he's like, we bet you think you're good. No, I didn't say anything. So you're going to fight my cousin. Out comes a cousin who's eight years older than son and much larger than son, who's been studying Shui Jiao, Chinese wrestling for a while. So son's trying to stand there, trying to talk him out of it. And he grabs him by his shirt and his pants, picks him up over his head and slams him into the ground. And son gets up and he grabs him in a Shui Jiao, you know, shirt lock and throws him again. And Sun gets up, and all of a sudden, Sun loses temper because his one good shirt had just gotten torn. And he knows he's not supposed to do anything, but his temper is gone. The guy comes in for a third time, and he used one of his Shaolin punches and nails a big guy right in the solar plexus. 
and the guy had already been feasting for the holidays and the guy falls down and pukes all over himself from the meal that he had eaten and the son runs off and gets the father and the father grabs a stick and tells Sun Lu, Sun Fu Kui, Sun Fu Chuen at the time that he was going to kill him with a stick and the servants hold him back and he runs off and he says, don't ever come back. If I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. So much for his job. So then he's home with mom and he starts trying to beg for money. And he isn't real successful as a beggar. And after that, he gets totally depressed. And it's like, my mom's in worse shape having me here than if not. And he goes out and he hangs himself. But a couple of travelers come by right after he hung himself and cut him down before there's any damage. And they talk to him and they feel sorry for him. And they take him home to his mom. They talk to the mom. They realize they're really in dire straits. And these two guys are, you know, okay. They're business guys. They're not dirt poor guys. So they go, okay. And they take them to where her brother, his uncle, lives. And they had, hadn't had the money to travel there. They could have got help there, but they didn't have enough money to even get there. And these two, like, um, really nice strangers bring them to the uncle's house. And the uncle has a successful shop where he sells calligraphy brushes. And he puts uh, Sun Fu Chuen to work, um, cutting and trimming and making the brushes. And while he's there, he also continues learning his reading and writing. And, of course, he doesn't have any money, and he can't really afford any, like, paper or ink or anything. He gets to use the, the leftover brushes that aren't so good. Mm -hmm. And he starts practicing with water on scraps of paper and newsprint and anything he can find. And his calligraphy is getting better and better. And his uncle notices that. And his uncle has two best friends one of whom is a scholar and one of whom is a martial arts instructor. And at one point, he realizes that his nephew's calligraphy is better than his. And he's sending a present, a birthday present, to his scholar friend. So he has the nephew write on the front of the, the package uh, what he wanted written for the guy's birthday. And the scholar gets it, and he's more impressed with the outside packing than he is with the present. He really says, wow, this is really good stuff. And he says, well, you know, my nephew did it. So they bring the nephew, and he goes, yeah, he really is. Um, let him stay with me and let me teach him, because this kid can really learn something. So while he's staying with the teacher and starting to learn the classics, not just reading and writing, but now he's getting into the classics and they realize that he's also a genius at memorizing the classics, the Confucian classics, the I Ching, all this stuff. The whole idea was to be able to read them, repeat them out loud by rote until you memorize them. Mm. And he was really good at that also. But the martial arts guy comes to visit the scholar and he gets introduced to him, and he discovers that he had done this martial art. So he asks him to show him what he knows and goes, wow, you're really good at this also. Uh, let me teach him also. And this guy turns out to be a Xing Yi teacher. And he trains uh, Sun for a couple of years. And Sun, uh, again, just gets better and better, learning pretty quickly. Until eventually the teacher says, well, I'm going to see my teacher. You've gotten good enough. Come along. Train with him for a bit. I haven't seen my teacher in a while. And he goes and introduces him to his teacher, who was the famous Guo Yun Shun, the divine crushing fist, the legendary number one fighter of all Xing Yi. And Guo checks him out and takes him as a student. And his teacher decides to stay and learn more from Guo himself. So the two of them are training with Guo Yun Shun, who, of course, we mentioned and told stories of Guo Yun Shun when we did our, our Xing Yi uh, episode. And study with Guo, stays with him for seven years, absorbs everything that there is in Xing Yi. And finally Guo says, okay, if you're going to improve your martial arts now, you should go and study with my Kung Fu brother. 
who teaches this new strange martial art called Baguazhang. And he takes him to Chantinghua. Now, of course, we've done a lot on Chantinghua because we do Chung style Baguazhang. Now, Chantinghua was the fourth disciple of the founder, Dung Hai Chuan, and how he'd been the Shui Jiao wrestling champ of Beijing when he started, and how he had a very successful school. And Sun is brought to him, and he checks Sun Lu Dang out and says, um, yeah, you should be able to learn this stuff pretty quickly. But, you know, you got to start at the beginning. And everybody was always starting him at the beginning. When he first went to Guo Yun Shun, after he had done all the Xing Yi with his teacher, Guo had him stand in San Ti for the first year. That's all he did. Stand in San Ti for the first year. Until at one point, Guo could sneak up on him and hit him in the back by surprise, and he didn't move. When that happened, Guo started teaching him some of his movements. Well, he goes to Chun Ting Hua, and Chun Ting Hua has him circle for the first year or so with just circling and a very simple change of direction. And then starts teaching him the system. And while he was circling and just circling, though, of course, he's watching the other students and he gets the idea of the palm strike. So on his own, he goes to some place where they have old cannons stored, huge cannons. And he starts practicing his palm striking on the cannons until he can move them a couple of inches because they were massive. And he's done that, and nobody has any idea he's doing it. Then, well, he's theoretically just in his only circling stage. This challenger from South China shows up at Chung School and challenges them. And a number of Chung senior students fight this guy and lose. Mm. And Chun Ting was like, well, I'm going to have to fight this guy myself. You know, you can't be ruining my school. And Sun goes up to him and says, well, why don't you let me fight him? He says, what do you mean fight him? You've been walking in a circle and doing nothing else. He says, well, you know, I, I know how to fight and I can do the footwork. And, and what the hell if I lose? A whole bunch of students lost anyway. So what if this junior student loses to him now? And then you could fight him after that, after I lose. But, you know, give me a chance. And who knows? Maybe you won't have to fight him. So the guy comes to Sun's school and attacks, I mean, to Chung Ting Hua's school and attacks Sun. And Sun sidesteps and hits him with the palm he's been hitting the, the cannons with and Drives the guy across the room and right out the window with one shot. <laughs> nice. And, and the story is that Chun Ting Hua <laughs> was so happy that he stands up and goes to Tehran, slaps the, the bench that he was sitting on and breaks the bench in half with his palm strike out of joy of Sun winning. And the southerner comes in and bows to Chun Ting Hua, says the south has lost to the great Chun Ting Hua. So they're all happy. And he realizes that Sun has been doing some stuff on his own, but he's gotten good at it. And then he teaches him the entire system. Within around, the around, what, of around what year? Around what years was that? Because he was born in 1860. What, around what? How old was he when he was doing that? Born 1861. So let's see, 10, 19, probably the 1880s. So he's in Maybe his 20s, kind of thing. Somewhere in the, yeah. I would imagine because he was 12 when he left his job mm. and then seven years Oops, with, yeah. well, well, then he spent some time with the uncle right. and then with the other teacher and then seven years with, with Guo Yun Shun. So he would have been into his twenties and it would have been right. the 1880s. Mid twenties kind of thing. And so Chen Ting Hua says, okay, you've got, you've got Bagua now. And if you want to get deeper, this stuff is based on deep Taoist studies. And if you want to go beyond this and get the real essence of the stuff, you should study that. And probably the mountains around Sichuan would be the place to do it. So why don't you, you do that? And he's like, I will, but you know, I can't do it right away. I have to make some money for my family. 
I've got a fiance back home that I've been putting off for years, and uh, she's not going to put up with it much longer. So I'll get to it. And he goes home, marries his fiance, starts teaching, making money for his family and whatnot. And then he gets enough money ahead and goes to the mountains of Sichuan and studies with the Taoists there, studying I Ching and Taoist studies in general. And while there, he learns of um, Wudang. So then he goes to Wudang Mountain and spends a year and a half or so there studying with the Taoists on Wudang Mountain mm. and doing their Qigong and their intellectual studies. And then he goes home and he gets an, he gets an invitation from some northern school to come up and teach. So he decides he could use an assistant and he takes one of the junior to him, but senior at the moment, students from the Chun Ting Hua school and brings a guy with him. And that was Li Wen Biao. Ring a bell, John? Mm -hmm. And that's where it connects into us directly. Li Wen Biao was La Jing Wu's Bagua teacher. La Jing Wu was Liu Jing Ru's teacher. And of course, Liu Jing Ru is mine and Jonathan's teacher. So he brought Li Wen Biao with him on this northern trip and was quite pleased with how that worked out. And then he comes back, and one of the other things he does is he starts two schools in Beijing and one in Tianjin. But he's wanted all over the place. So he's moving around between the three schools and getting other jobs here and there doing that. So he uh, hires a head instructor for the three schools. And the head instructor that he hires is Li Wen Biao. And so Li Wen Biao actually ran his three schools for him when they started for a while. Mm. And along the way, he has things happening like one of my favorite stories that, again, like his daughter says, there's a lot of stories of him that were built up way beyond the beyond. Uh, like she points out that um, Guo Yun Shun used to have him follow along behind his horse and keep the tail over his crushing fist arm out and keep up. And she points out, but they were not galloping or running like all the stories it would have been, you know, a slow trot or a walk. The idea was he had to keep his arm up. So I couldn't guarantee this story, but I love this story is that he's at some place on the coast, uh, either Tianjin or Shanghai. And this Russian shows up and goes to the officials and tells them, I'm here to show that Chinese martial arts are no good. And I'll fight anybody you can bring in. And they decide the ranking person in town is Sun Lu Dong. Hmm. So they bring him in and go, look, you're the ranking guy. And so you're going to fight this guy. And they have a meeting in the government office to sign the contract. And Sun checks this guy out. And as someone that's far a little bit, I can understand what's going on. Sun, by the way, five foot seven, 140 pounds. And all of a sudden he's looking at this gigantic Russian He's going through his mind is, I don't want this guy in a big platform where there's room to move. This just this isn't going to work out with give this guy room to move. Mm -hmm. So he gets in the guy's face, gets the guy angry, gets the guy to go for him in the office, sidesteps, does a little quick internal move, and slams him through a glass of mahogany cabinet, completely destroying the cabinet and the Russian. Now, this day and age, if you went to sign a contract and instead you smashed a guy through a cabinet and <laughs> messed him all up, you'd be arrested for assault. But this is China in the early 1900s. So he, uh, instead, the next day they have a great ceremony and give him a brass <laughs> plaque for saving the honor of the Chinese people. Right. Oh, and to, to backtrack a little bit, when he left Chun Ting Hua's, Chun Ting Hua said, you need a new name. And Chun Ting Hua gave him Lu Dong. He became Sun Lu Dong after studying with Chun Ting Hua and it's Chun Ting Hua that gave him the name Sun Lu Dong. Why, why a new and, name was needed? What was that, what's that about? Well, it was an upper level name. It was an honorable thing to get a name from your teacher. Mm. So it was sort of a gift, the name. Do we know anything about the meaning, Frank? 
I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you said we. <laughs> How about you? Um, uh, no. <laughs> um, but that led to stuff like at one point he went to this person's school and the, the, and the guy says, who are you? And he says, I'm Sun Lu Don. And the guy's like, I never heard of you. And I'm going to challenge you. And, and after he throws the guy around, the guy goes, you're who? He says, well, I'm Sun Lu Don. I used to be known as Sun Fu Chuen. He's like, Sun Fu Chuen? We're from the same school. I never would have started with you if I knew you were Sun Fu Chuen. <laughs> so Didn't it, get it took the memo. A while. The email wasn't yeah. sent out with the name change. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But uh, so he had numerous things going on like that. In 1915, he published his first book, which was uh, the study of form and mind boxing, Xing Yi Chuen, which is actually available in English now. But that was the first internal martial arts book published. Mm. And then by in the next four years, he put out his uh, Bagua book. He put out his um, Taiji book. And then after that, he put out a book on sword. He put out a book, which I wish was available now, on the internal martial arts and Taoist studies and philosophy which I've never seen in English that they mentioned in the bio that he put that book out. Mm. And of course his Tai Chi was different from anyone else's. His Tai Chi came about when he uh, heard that in Beijing, this master Hao, who was a top student of Wu Yuxing, mm -hmm. who had been the first major moneyed student of Yang Lu Chan when he first left Chen village and before he ever went to to uh, uh, the capital and started teaching the, the Imperial Guard and it's sort of an, an interim style and then Wu Yuxing took what he learned from Yang Lu Chan and also studied with Chen Jinping the founder of the Chen style fast explosive form cannon fist form and created his own style, which is considered one of the five family styles in China these days. But his main student was Hao. And in fact, in the West, his style is generally known as Wu Hao. Just because as Westerners, we never can get the difference between Wu and Wu, which are two completely different styles. Wu's from Wu Yuxing. Wu's from Wu Chuanyo. And uh, totally different style. So it becomes Wu Hao. So Hao actually got his name attached to it. But Hao was basically sort of a country bumpkin type. And but he knew the Yang family. And he particularly was friends with Yang Jinho, Yang Luchan's second son. And at one point, he goes to Beijing, which is where Sun Lu Dang spent most of his middle and later adult life living in Beijing and goes to find Yang and can't find him. This is how he's in a hotel. Yes. Oh, okay. How goes to find Yang and can't find him and gets ill and ends up in a, a flea bag hotel and sick and running out of money when Sun Lu Dong hears of this and he doesn't even know anything about the guy except that he's a noted martial artist and he's mm. in trouble. And son's doing very well then. So he goes and gets the old guy, brings him home, gets him a doctor, nurses him back to health. And when he gets back to health, Howe's like, well, I don't have anything but my skill, but I really want to give you something for doing this for me. Let me teach you my Tai Chi. And son's okay. So he learned Howe's Tai Chi before Howe leaves, probably absorbing it pretty quickly because by that time he was already a noted and great. Shingi and Bagua master, so he learns stuff quickly. But he absorbs Hao's Tai Chi. Hao goes home on his way. And he starts thinking about Tai Chi and like, well, hmm, how about if I kind of combine the stuff? And he created Sun Style Tai Chi, by which is basically noted for having Bagua footwork, 
shingy body postures and Taiji softness. Mm. And it became his own style, which is actually recognized as the fifth of the five family styles in China these days and was his own Taiji. So that's what would have gotten written up in his Taiji book, which is also available in English. It's interesting, the Shingi book and the Taiji book are widely published. I have seen the Bagua book, but only by some little rinky-dink amateur publishing company. No one's ever done the, that I know of, the Bagua book correctly. But he put out these, these three books and was, as I said, the noted scholar, fighter, school founder, um, the outstanding internal martial artist of, of all time, pretty much. And when he got old, he decided that he had figured out exactly when he was going to die by using the E J. That he had figured out the month, the day, the hour. And of course, everybody thought, well, the guy's really great, but this is a little off the wall. And then when the year was coming around, he's like, well, I want to go back to Bading, where I was born, and I want to live there for a while. So I went back, and he took 18 students, and they became his last 18 students. And they trained with him, and he trained them until they were fairly proficient in what they were learning. And then it came along, and he told his family, okay, the day's coming up when I'm going to die. And they're all like, well, Grandpa's friend just died. He's kind of depressed. You know, he's a bit wacky with his mystical stuff. And they didn't pay too much attention. And then finally the day comes along and he gets up and he doesn't put any clothes. He's naked. And he sits naked in a chair and says, I came to this world empty. I'm going to go out empty. And they're like, yeah, Grandpa's really losing it now, but he'll be better by dinner and we'll get over this or whatnot. And he meditates. When they go to talk to him during the day, no one can get him to say anything because he's sitting in the chair naked and meditating. Three times during the day, he looks up and goes, what time is it? And they tell him. And after the third time, when they tell him what time it is, he says, okay, goodbye. You know, don't worry about me. Everything's going to be fine. And uh, it's been fun. And he sits there, and the next time they look over, he's dead. Exactly when he said he would be. <laughs> it's like... So the life and times of Sun Lu Dong were pretty amazing and pretty efficiently prolific in spreading and enhancing, great enhancements of the internal martial arts. Wow. You know what I was thinking of? I'm just thinking about his um, traje trajectory and, 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 and his... Um the systems that he learned. I mean, we, we kind of talk about, not that there's a recommended age. We I don't think that's the language we use, but we talk about during different phases of one's uh, life cycle, how um, Shingi can be a little bit more um, appropriate energy if you're younger and that kind of energy. And then Bagua, um, a little bit more in the middle of your life. And then, and then uh, Taiji more towards the end. Um, Again, we, we haven't said that that's exclusively, but uh, it just kind of plays into the energies I think we've talked about. But that's kind of like um, his trajectory. And also, too, it sounds like the one that he trained in the least under direct master was the Taiji. Is that is that correct? And and, and but was able to create his own style. Um, and I, ju I, I just it always reminds me of the. Um, the internal martial arts and all the transferable knowledge from each of them to one another and how um, even though it may have been the system that he trained the least directly under a master, um, all that experience and knowledge and genius from training in the other systems on the, on, on the master for so long um, just kind of clicked um, and he was able to create his own unique style. Again, fusing them all, but I thought that was pretty cool. Well, Hao was considered a pretty great Taiji master. I mean, he was the number one student of Wu Yu Xing. It's just it's hard to hold a candle to Sun Ludong when you're teaching Sun Ludong. 
but how, like I said, the system gets called Wu Hao. Um, Hao was considered a pretty great master, but the whole thing was how quickly he picked it up. Because, you know, in a few weeks before the guy went back home to farm country in uh, Kuangping province, he uh, learned this very quickly because he was such a highly efficient martial artist and had been for decades and decades. But not to put down Hao as not being a great master. Hao was a great master himself. But yeah, it was the last one and the one that he probably put the least time in. Um, considering it was, you know, 10 years of Shingi, three years of Bagua, and then working them on his own for decades after that, when he just kind of absorbed this Tai Chi. And like most of the Bagua Shingi guys that get into Tai Chi later, he was um, enamored of the softness. Because that's the one big difference between the Tai Chi and the others. As they say, um, a Tai Chi boxer's body is supposed to feel like thick, thick layers of cotton over an iron bar, but thick layers of cotton on the outside. Mm. And a Xing Yi boxer's body is supposed to feel just the opposite. It's supposed to feel like a steel outer coating with a liquid inside. And then they say a uh, Bagua boxer's body is supposed to feel like a uh, coiled copper spring or coiled copper cable. Um, so it's a softness that gets them. But I find it interesting. Yes, in the early times, the guys that did all three almost always did Xing Yi, then Bagua, and then Tai Chi. But most of us here that do all three generally did exactly the opposite. I know I did, but most everybody that I trained with, because Tai Chi was here first. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, a couple years of Tai Chi under my belt when B.P. Chan showed up and started teaching Bagua. And then he taught Bagua for about a year and a half before he started teaching Xing Yi. So myself and everybody that went through that route, we did Tai Chi, Bagua, and then Xing Yi. And most of the people I've met in modern times in America, at least with my generation, that's the way we went exactly the opposite for Taiji Bagua Xing Yi, as opposed to the classic, which does fit more people's phases in life, would be Xing Yi Bagua Taiji. Sean, also, uh, it's, it's actually not as impressive to create your own Tai Chi. What's impressive... <laughs> is to be recognized right. by the other four systems <laughs> for the Tai Chi that you have created. There's, there's hundreds, if not maybe even thousands of people who have like created some style and get kind of not respected for it by the classical styles. So being brought into that, uh, to that very small group, that's what really sets it apart um, and sort of shows his genius. I'd be willing to bet that all these multitude of new styles you're talking about were mostly created in the last 60 years. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. From the 1960s on. Okay. <laughs> like no one would dare prior to that claim their own style. No, a very few. Frank, um, something that's curious to me when I was listening to the story, years and years ago, you and I, I think I asked you some of the components that were common to how people got really high level as, as martial arts masters. And I feel like then you said something like uh, basically having the time to practice often meant that you were from a, at least a somewhat upper class background. Um, and you could correct me if I'm remembering this wrong, but it was just simply a, a thing of like the average um, working class or poor person didn't really have the amount of time, you know, they're doing other types of work unless they were maybe a, in the bodyguard or the you know, martial arts work. Um, I think it's interesting that Sun is like a very clear example of somebody who 
came from the absolute opposite, but was recognized by people. Um, and if somebody saw talent, they were like, if some of these teachers, they were willing to actually pay the student or support the student while they were training. Is that what was going on? They would have to be very talented, as in they felt that their student was going to build up the reputation of their school and their right. organization. And if they saw somebody of that level, which Sun Lu Dong was, it did happen that way. And as I said previously, yes, either you were well-to-do and you got to study, or as I pointed out before, the Ching Wu Physical Culture Association started in the teens in Shanghai, most all martial arts schools were vocational training. So someone that had enough family backing to go and get into a school and then enough talent to prove themselves to be good enough to, because most of the schools were adjuncts of uh, guarding businesses. You had a business where you had bodyguards, security guards, cargo guards, etc., And you proved yourself talented enough that they were going to be able to use you. And I would imagine they would get you in a contract for you'd study, but you would owe them X amount of years of work for this study. Mm -hmm. So working class people could do that, but they couldn't be, you know, dirt poor farmers because you had to have your initially get into the school and then prove yourself as good enough to be able to work in the guard service attached to the school or be in the military and have the military get you or your family get you enough money to study so because you had to have certain physical martial skills to move your way up as far as ranking rank wasn't just you'd been there long enough or you developed a few little skills you had to the skills for moving up the ranks in the military were really heavy heavy duty physical training and martial arts test at each level. So people, if they could, would go to a school to try and prepare themselves to move up from being just a common soldier to move up the ranks in the military. But that's what most of the training was. And either you were just well-to-do enough to hire a really good teacher. The rich people would hire good teachers to come and train their offspring. And other than that, either you would, had enough scratch to get started and then could prove yourself that you would be worthwhile to the company, or you were using your military money to work your way up a rank. And that was, was pretty much it. But yes, a lot of the people were, because also if you're doing the guard work and you're working the military, you don't have as much practice time as somebody who's just your father's rich enough to pay for some master to come and be the household teacher. So, yes, a lot of it was um, money. And for whatever reason, it was noted that most of the people that were being trained for work purposes and military purposes were doing the external or external slash internal martial arts and the three internal martial arts got the reputation of most of the people that trained heavily in them and got quite good in them were the people who were moneyed students. Mm, that's interesting. Well, definitely sounds like some material motivation for son um, trying to, you know, get good at this stuff and learn this stuff and doing self-study and all that kind of stuff. I, the qu well, a question I had, it was, uh, um, you, you keep saying how Sun um, is, is one, if not the most influential internal martial artist. Is that because he started putting out a lot of, well, outside of him being uh, a, a, you know, a masterful martial artist, is it because he started putting out publications and teaching for um, the Institute in Beijing, it, it, just kind of like um, you know, putting out the martial arts more than anyone up before him? Well, yes. First off, he had the first published books on the arts. Second off, he was the first person, and still to this point, maybe the most extensive studying of Chinese philosophy, mm -hmm. mysticism, energy work, uh, heavy Taoism practices to 
add to his and work with his um, internal martial arts. In fact, the whole nine palace system, which perhaps we'll get into in one of these, but I'm not quite sure how to talk about it without showing it, but maybe eventually. But the whole nine palace system came into Bagua through Sun Ludan. So there was all of that also, that a lot of those higher level studies and the correlations mm -hmm. to the internal martial arts, the uh, I Ching correlations we were doing in our last podcast had a lot to do with Sun Ludan bringing it into the Bagua system, into the Bagua schools. And that combined with, he taught all over the place. I mean, he had those schools in Beijing and right. Tianjin. At one point, he taught in the National Academy in Nanjing. He was hired by different people to, to teach privately. Um, he taught pretty much all over the place. So he was a very, very extensive teacher also. And you put that all together, and it pretty much makes him what I would consider the most influential internal martial artist in history. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. I mean, it sounds like he uh, is like a notable Taoist scholar or, you know, like like a master on, on all these fronts kind of thing. Um, yeah, there, there was one famous meeting where this Taoist scholar or this uh, scholar of all three, probably Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism, as well as Chinese philosophy and studies in general, had a number of meetings with Sun Ludong where they discussed this stuff. And afterwards, he said to people, this person is not just a major martial artist. He's one of the major scholars in China at the same time also. Mm -hmm. And of course, and again, not coming from, coming from a point where at one point he was so poor, he hung himself to keep his mother from having to support him and coming from that to who he became. And, uh, you know, lived from 1861 to 1933 which in those days was a decent length of life. Yeah. And from doing martial arts from 10 years old on. Awesome. And is there, we've talked about it before, but um, if folks are looking for more, to study more about him, um, is there any good books that they should look into, things that he's done or bios on him that you could recommend? Well, his Shingy book, um, like I said, um, the study of form mind boxing, Jing Yi Chuen, is out there and was also put out by people who got the copy from his daughter, who just passed away 15 years or so ago, mm. and did a bunch of interviews with her. She wrote a biography of him in Chinese, which they got, and they do a bio in the front of that book. So there's not just a Xing Yi book. It has the bio of Sun Ludong. And that's probably the, the best book to get. And then his Tai Chi book is out there also. And then he gets mentioned in most, if they're doing a compilation of Chinese martial artists, Sun Ludong will come up. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's things out there. The number one would be that Xing Yi book because of the bio in the front. Have, you, like heard I said, of, have you heard of one called The Internal Practices of Sun Ludong, Frank? It's uh, compiled writings. It's, uh, in, it's in Amazon, so and it's hmm. available on Kindle or in paperback. Wow. What's the name of it again? Because I hadn't. The Internal Practices of Sun Ludong. Wow. Um, which is that. interesting too because it says it's compiled writings but uh in one of the things i was reading before this podcast i think it was his 60th birthday party someone stole his personal notes and they said it's never been found again like he had <laughs> <laughs> it's on amazon now <laughs> so i don't know if this is like uh other notes either written after or you know whatever but it, it's kind of an interesting um <laughs> also what a great birthday present thanks 
Well, apparently it wasn't that uncommon because in the interviews with his daughter, she mentioned that he left with her a mostly done but not quite finished book on Shingy Spear and told her to finish it. And before she got to finish it, somebody stole the manuscript from her. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Classy. <laughs> And, so apparently uh, this stealing manuscript thing was not that uncommon. Yeah. And um, so uh, the Sun Taiji uh, system, uh, like how would you describe it? It's pretty much different from other Taijis. There's a lot of like soft stepping. There's a lot of follow step, which isn't used that much. It's a... a Bagua and Shingi minor stepping where you step up and you bring the other foot up lightly behind you mm -hmm. on the ball of the foot with the heel up. And there's a lot of that follow step going in it. And it's soft, but it doesn't quite flow around. It's soft, but it's got a lot of forward and back and forward and back and right angle changes. But uh, it's different. It's very different, but it's obviously still Taiji Chuan. Awesome. Cool. So, so, Frank, based on that description, it sounds like uh, the Xing Yi aspects of uh, sound more prominent, or the, the Xing Yi influence sounds more prominent than the Bagua Zhang. Is that, does that sound about right? or? Well, there's no outright circling, so... Okay. But some of the footwork is like you would step in, in Bagua. Okay. But there's no circling. Yeah, I, I, I'm definitely going to look into it, see if I can find some more content, see if we can share it in the show notes. Um, well, Tina was teaching Sun Style for a while. We have uh, a close friend of her family in Beijing, a very close friend. Uh He's almost the black sheep of the family because most of the members of the family were traditional Chinese doctors mm. of the level. It was his grandfather, a great grandfather, I think, who was a doctor for Puyi, the last emperor. And his father, a grandfather, was a doctor for Mao. And his cousin runs one of the biggest, most famous traditional um, Chinese traditional medicine clinics in Beijing. Mm. And actually, Tina, as part of her medical studies, got to study with the father, with the old man, a few times before he passed away. Now, it's a really great opportunity for her again to study with him. And as such, I went with her at one point. I don't know, were you with us or not, John, when we went to the big clinic? Nope, I wasn't and, with you on that one. And we went to this huge clinic. But then he's in his, his office. And there's this glass wall with this dark room there. And he says, oh, let me show you where I do my martial arts training. And he clicks on the light and you see we go in the room. But you can see this martial arts training room with weapons and pads and <laughs> pictures of a Chen style master and pictures of Sun Ludong's daughter. Mm. And... His cousin, who had brought us there, was his friend, said, I never saw this. And he said, you don't do martial arts, so I never showed it to you. But you brought these people to do. And it turns out that he was a disciple of one of the Chen masters and a disciple of Sun Ludang's daughter. <clears throat> so that connection, Tina did Sun Style for a while and taught it for a while. And it's one of those things that we teach for a while and then it kind of drifts away. And uh, it's like, I don't know who remembers it now, but I'm sure somebody does. Gia used to be really, really good at it. Marcos used to know it. But uh, I actually knew it at one point, but I didn't get that heavily into it. And of course, Tina knew it very well, but she's, there's only so much you can hang on to. The whole thing of I've uh, forgotten more forms than you ever learned after a certain point actually becomes a reality. And uh, that's, with me, that's on the list. <laughs> 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 but 
But yeah, we actually had our sun style period in the Wudong Physical Culture Association. Very cool. Awesome. Well, yeah, I think that I, that was a great um, bio. And if anyone has any follow up questions um, or comments or um, any add ons to any of the stories, feel free to definitely drop it in the comment section. And um, and yeah, we'll try to source some of those links and links to some of the books that we were uh, discussing and get into the show notes as well. Um, so, yeah. So thanks so much for that, guys. I think we are. Um, I'm looking at our metrics here. We're doing great on our uh, subscribers on YouTube. So definitely uh, uh, thanks for sharing all the content on there. But we still are looking to uh, do a push for our iTunes reviews. Um, so if you can, drop an iTunes review. It only takes a couple minutes to do it. Um, and we'll put that link in the show notes as well so people can um, get the direct link to drop the review. And hopefully, of course, it's a positive review. Um, you know, be honest. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, that really helps us get more exposure for the show. Um, and we've been doing this uh, for a few months now. Um, and, you know, it, I mean, over half a year of producing content. So it's really cool to see. Um, all that come together and we want to keep doing it and we want to keep pushing out good topics. Uh, so let us know what you want to hear and keep uh, sharing the content and supporting us. Any final thoughts, Frank? Um, just I'm glad to do this. I'm amazed there was nothing video wise on Sun Lu Dong because he's such an important personage. There's there's the content that I came across was only um, people practicing his style that's all I could find. So it's, it's good that there's now there'll be something that's, um, you know, if somebody wants to listen to a something some biographical. Pattern. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah. Great to put it together. All right, guys. So we'll see y'all next week. And uh, until then, have a great one. All right. Take care. Thanks. <laughs>